I'm Chris Bussing. Welcome to my channel. This is the place where you come to start and grow your career in tech sales and use this path as a vehicle to creating a life of freedom and impact. I bring on the best names in B2B sales, including Nate Nasrallah today, who runs Fluent.io and just came out with a book, Selling With. And uh, by the way, Nate, uh, carry the torch here. What's the rest of the title of the book? Selling With, and what's the full title? Yeah. Yep, the art of shaping internal buying conversations to close enterprise deals. Love it. So guys, I checked out the book myself and I encourage you to check it out too. I linked it in the description of this video. We're going to talk about the new book and this paradigm shift to, to move from selling to customers to selling with them on the same side of the table. If you get value out of this video, make sure to give that like button a love tap because the YouTube algorithm loves that too and will show this video to more people who could benefit from the message. And of course, share. And subscribe to the channel. I got your back with more uh, interviews every week with folks like Nate. All right, Nate, let's dig into it. I wanted to start out with your journey into sales. Did you ever think you'd get into sales and be an author of a top book like this? It's pretty amazing. Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. I kind of um, just kind of stumbled into sales by way of building companies and products. And you realize pretty quickly that in order to make anything happen and the company go, you need to sell. <laughs> so I uh, um, founded, co-founded a company after a short stint in consulting. And I kind of realized, I, I appreciated, by the way, the way you started the conversation around creating the level of impact that you want to have in your career and in your work life. And I kind of got into building products and building companies because I wanted to have more impact. And then that's where I started to realize pretty quick is like, oh, the show stops if we're not selling. And so I kind of took over the sales motion, built out the sales team, and then kind of did that over and over uh, for a number of companies since then, including now uh, Fluent, my current company. So what is the difference or even the similarities between consulting and sales? Because when I came out of college, I was thinking, do I want to go the consulting route or go into sales? And I just want to get your thoughts on the intersection, the differences of those two paths. So one of the, the closest parallels specifically between selling complex deals, which I'll define very simply as a number of different buyers all having to come to consensus to form up some type of point of view on like, what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve? What's the right way to go about it? Um, what are the ways to measure in which we're improving the problem? That, so that's a complex deal. A lot of people will kind of talk about it by way of contract size, or it has to be a six, seven figure you know, plus deal. Simply put, when you have to get a lot of different people all aligned on a specific point of view, that in essence is consulting coming in and helping people understand their root or the core set of drivers behind a problem and the right way to go about solving it. And so in that sense, it's, it's very similar because it takes a structured way of one, identifying and then two, framing up the problem. So I would say there is a ton of similarities um, granted, I only have a you know set of experiences that I have, but if you were to draw a comparison between sales and any other field, and like I don't think I'm the first one to say this by any means, consultative selling is kind of a thing. Like yes. they are, they are very very similar. Yeah, they they really are, and uh, yeah, I found in in the B two B sales space for myself, it, being at Oracle, uh, Google Cloud, and now a cloud consulting firm, it. it it really is consultative. It's not transactional. Do you have any thoughts on the, the difference between like a transactional mindset and being like a more of a consultant and trusted advisor and like what that looks like in action? Yeah, well, one of the, and kind of this is the core of the work that I'm doing now every single day and week at Fluent. One of the main differences is a more transactional sale is very much focused on here's the product. This is what it is. Um, do you want to pay this price for that product? Whereas inside of a more consultative based sale, what you're helping the customer begin to unpack and believe for themselves is, okay, this is the problem that is costing us something. We're trying to move from where we are today, some type of problem, where we want to go tomorrow, some type of payoff. And is this the right vehicle to get us to that? And oftentimes, if you're doing your good, a good job in a consultative sell, you will say, hey, I did my job well, and that was a win as a seller if I help the buyer pick the right path for them, which could be going with an alternative approach. It could be um, a lot of different teams will do kind of an internal build buy. Do we even need to buy something, go with some type of partner for this? And so in a consultative sale, you're helping the customer not just look at 
this is the product, this is what it does, but what is the right way to go about solving a true problem? So I had a mentor at Oracle and he was so funny. Like he actually made a million dollars a year. He would flash his W-2 and that, that might be kind of an insecurity there, a little overcompensation, but he was a top seller and he came from a consulting background and he would say, let's, Chris, take the tech out of tech. This was when I was an SDR who's mentoring me. And I'm wondering if you, do you agree with that statement that it, the way I interpreted it is like a salesperson needs to even, no matter how technical your sale needs to become an expert in solving business problems and delivering outcomes. And then maybe quarterbacking the right technical resources. But do you agree with that statement or how do you interpret that? Take the tech out of tech. Or do you think it's actually important to be technical? So I think it's, it's both and. And it all comes down to who is the particular person inside of the buying group or circle that you're speaking with at that moment. And so often part of this is, by the way, part of the shift to selling with your buyers you may have, let's say somebody comes to you from a very technical role. They're drawn toward the product because they're like, look, my current workflow sucks. It's not getting the job done. And I want to get a different product in place. Now, from their point of view, it is about the tech. And they're going to want to know, do you understand? And can you help me evaluate this in a helpful way? And that's where, by the way, it's not just about you as the seller. You may have a solutions engineer, others with you, right? But there will be a technical sale component. However, if that particular buyer wants to green light the project, the budget uh, to go live with it overall, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to go sell it internally. And what language is the person that they are selling to speak? It's probably not going to be <laughs> very technical. It's the things that they own, which will probably be line items on a P&L. And so if you can't help them directly tie a change in tech here, rolls up to and impacts the PL in this way, in a very believable and concrete way, then it's going to be very hard to sell at that level, which will ultimately get the deal done. So that's the art of helping that one buyer sell internally by speaking both languages, crossing from technical to more business outcomes, you know, in the case of your mentor there. Already such gold and we're just seven minutes and 17 seconds in. I love it. Um, you know, Nate, I had someone named Olaf from Sweden reach out to me from my channel. He sent me a nice email. Shout out to Olaf if you're watching this. And he said, Chris, I'm 18 and I know sales is the path for me. And I'm thinking about going to... You know, like, because should I just go get into sales at, at, at right away or go to a college that teaches me like finance and marketing? And like, I'm, he mentioned a degree. I'm like, that's actually a really cool degree. Yeah. But um, what I want to ask you is do you think going to a good university? There's two questions nested in this. Do you think going to a good university is a good move or an, a critical move to be successful in sales or not? And also how important is financial acumen? So I threw two questions at once, with, okay. which is kind of a cardinal sin, but let's focus on the first one of, is an academic path like the best move or not? I just take it where you may. Okay. So um, the answer is, I would look at it as a little less of a binary choice. Do I either go to college? Do I go into sales? Either or. And I'll give you kind of my background. So when I first um, went to university, um, I first went in into the military. I was in the army. Oh. Eventually, I got pushed out because I have chronic asthma, some kind of health stuff that got in the way. I couldn't get enough medical waivers. And so I got pushed out. And that made me think like, okay, well, there goes that career plan. Um, I got to figure out something completely different that I want to do. And so I, I started taking finance classes. It was a finance major. My thought was, okay, well, if I can if I can think in a more technical specialized field and I can learn some of those skills, then if I end up wanting to do something with more soft skills like communications management, something like that, then great. At least I have those hard skills to fall back on. So I started to go that route and I was drawn you know, pretty immediately to building businesses. And so there was a group of friends who, um, so I went to University of Illinois and there's a pretty big entrepreneurship program there. Um, they had started building a business called ts to Company, where you could um, think of it as kind of like the vitamin water of tea, where we would brand for a younger kind of demographic and consumer based on what the tea did. Is it energizing? Does it boost your immunity? So on versus what the leaf is. It was kind of an interesting business model. But while I was taking finance classes over here, I started to build out the sales program for them. And so I would literally have to go to my professors and be like, hey, I'm actually going to be flying to New York because I'm going to meet with Whole Foods 
to try to pitch them on this new line of tea. So like, I can't actually be here for this exam. And the amount of support that I got in the amount of times that people changed exams in a class of like three, 400 people, right? Yeah. W- was incredibly supportive. Um, and it was a, for me, it was a great path to go because when I started going back into classes, uh, I looked at them very differently because I was like, I had a, I had a job. I was building a company while also going to school. So what I would say is I made the most of the tuition payments in the yeah. class that I was taking because I was applying it in real time, number one. Um, and then I, number two, back where I started, I would, I would look at it as a little less either or. Do I go to school? Do I go into sales? The beautiful thing is you can do both. Wow. You just blew my mind because I didn't think about that path that you, you can find a middle ground. You can get sales experience. You can go to school and learn. And um, it does seem that financial acumen, which you've obviously uh, developed, is critically important in talking to C-levels. Do you, do you find that's really elevated your conversations? Oh, yeah. Mostly in the sense of like most people when they haven't, um, call it inexperience because you just haven't done it before, view of yeah. sales an outsider's view of sales, I'll call it. The perception is you have to go in there and wow people with what you want to say, how you want to pitch, what you want to talk about the product. And it's very much the opposite. If you have a financial level of acumen, you know what questions you want to ask. You know where to poke. You know how to develop and evolve a conversation based on questions that are perceptive and smart and on point and make somebody else say like, oh, you are, you're understanding what's mm-hmm. going on in our business in a way that I'm not seeing others understand. And if mm-hmm. you can't get to that level of clarity on the problem, there's a saying, a, a, a problem well stated is half solved. And the idea is like financial acumen, business acumen, um, in general, a, a strong understanding of the fundamentals of how a company deploys cash in order to generate more than what it is spending. Mm. That will help you in that conversation, which again, that is sales. Sales isn't, here's my product and what it does. So very much so. In fact, actually, while we're talking, um, I think it's on my bookshelf over here. I got to see if I can, if I can find it. Um, here we go. So this would be one of, one of what I would say is like the um, greatest sales books. So after I, I came out of school, was you know uh, building a sales program at the tea company. I mentioned I went into consulting. I didn't really know exactly what I, I wanted to do, and I was like, okay, consulting. Um, it'll give me a big variety of different projects. I can kind of figure out what I like. And so I fell back on um, some of the finance skills that I was picking up, and I started building valuation models. Was kind of my uh, job in consulting. But this book, so it's called Case in Point by a guy named Mark Constantino. And like, you can see how marked up it is inside of here. Yeah. It's like, you know, highlights and whatnot. It's basically a way for people who are going into consulting. It presents a series of business problems. And then it gives you a mental model or a framework for breaking that down into its pieces in order to recommend some type of solution. And so what I would do with but the roommate that I was living in at the time, he would pick a case. It's, a very, it's more of like a workbook. Yeah, he would pick a case, and for hours at you know night over dinner, we're hanging out. He would just drill me on these cases. He would give me the business problem. I'd break it down. I'd craft up a little executive summary. I'd play it back to him, and we just do that over and over. You know, there's like maybe a hundred or two hundred cases in here. Wow. And that this is one of the best forms of sales training. I actually never went through any type of formal sales training. Really. Oh. Um, because I got into building companies and then building teams. And so, yeah. you know, like a lot of what I've learned about the typical sales language and lingo, I learned ever since building Fluent and I'm selling to sales teams. And I hear people use phrases like above or below the line. And I'm like, intuitively, I know what they're talking about. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. It's because, you know, there was a sales trainer that came up with that phrase. Um, but everything else, I either A, learned by doing, or B, by applying different called skill sets frameworks from other fields onto sales by analogy. Wow. Yeah. And what a nugget there to learn by doing and applying. Um, it sounds like you've 
the reality is you've gotten to action as an entrepreneur and in business to become ultimately like this seller on steroids, like this top notch McKinsey esque consultant of a seller. And I just think that's really cool. And I love looking at the book there. This was such a cool little moment for this uh, live podcast to see how you marked it all up and you had sticky notes. Can you walk us through the mind of uh, Nate Nasrallah and how you like, what was that all about? Like, how, how do you even like, it, it seems like when you learn, you, you're a sponge and you really dive in. Like, how do you learn better? I guess that's just where my brain's going right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, part, part of it is like, I just have a lot of fun with it, man. Like m most people don't spend hours and hours a week, like practicing cases with their roommate because it's not, it's not fun. Right. But for me, it's fun. Um, and so um, I, wor I work with and have for many years a therapist. And one of the things, the assessments that he had me take was this thing called the spark type. The spark type tells you what gives you energy and what drains you. And um, my spark type is a learner. Like I, I just love learning for the sake of learning because that gives me back energy mm -hmm. uh, in my week. And so that's why I would do things like, you know, practice cases just for the heck of it. So I think if you are in my senses, people who are watching this, they probably are along the same lines where they just love to learn. They love to understand from different mm. fields, different disciplines, different people, you know, what they can soak up. So that's, that's the, I guess the biggest thing that I would say, and it reminds me of, um, so the guy that founded a company called um, AngelList, uh, Naval yeah. Rabicon. Okay. Oh yeah. Folk. Oh my gosh. What a, what a, a guy. Yeah. So in that book, he talks about how he's like, look, my biggest competitive edge is that I just, I genuinely enjoy the work that I'm doing. Mm. The work that I'm doing feels like play to me and it feels like work to others. So when it comes to competing for a role, a job inside of the marketplace, building companies, he's like, I'm a very hard person to beat because I, I am just having fun and for others it's work. And I feel the same way. For me, when it comes to building Fluent, when it comes to selling, and that's the edge is like, if you're having fun, same thing as like I uh, raced competitive Ironman um, for years. Wow. It would be like, you know, nine, 10, 11 hour race. That sounds miserable. Like, how do you even train for that? And I'm like, I love going for a three, four hour bike ride. And if you don't like doing that, then don't do it. You know, if it's not fun for you then don't do it. So um, nothing like earth shattering, but I would just say like, find the thing that gives you a little bit of energy in life and have fun with it. Yeah. You just revealed a secret to sustain success in anything is coming from a place of passion and having fun with it. And that's the cool thing about these interviews. I get to travel to the planet of your perspective with all your wisdom and your experience. So that, that's cool. And I need to dig into something else. You mentioned therapy. And I'm going to see my therapist, Suzanne, on Saturday. I'm a big yeah. believer. And so what, what role has therapy played in your life as you look to, you know, unleash your potential and live, cultivate your well-being? Like, I'm kind of putting, shoot, I'm putting words in your mouth, but sure. what role has therapy played in your life? Yeah, it, um, it gives me, I'll go kind of back to, like, not too dissimilar from this whole idea of, like, creating a series of mental frameworks to structure your thinking about something whether it's a business problem for me, it may be a, just a, an emotional problem where I am obsessing and ruminating over a series of negative thoughts. And I don't have a framework to break out of that and to see that circumstance or whatever it is from a different point of view. And so therapy for me is about downloading a different set of frameworks or ways of thinking to break out of, um, a ne whether it's a negative thought pattern, thought life, and I mean, it makes all the difference in the world in my marriage and how I relate to my wife, the type of person I am around my daughter, um, the way in which I, I try to be more calm and even in the office, because obviously things don't, you're building an early stage company, like nothing ever goes according to plan, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I truly can't rec recommend it enough. And I would say the lowest points in my life and career is because I was ignoring and trying to um, figure it out on my own. And I didn't have the perspective nor the tools to do it. And so when I finally decided, okay, this was, this was around like 2018, I started um, working with a therapist. It was, you know, it was a, a, like 
a breakthrough. Um, and I don't use that word breakthrough lightly, truly. Um, it was. Mm. Yeah. I mean, thank you for sharing that and for your vulnerability. And it, I, I don't even want to use that term anymore because I just like going to therapy is a strong thing. And it's just a, it's a practical thing if you are someone who wants to live a life of uh, just at your full potential. So extremely helpful. And by the way, I want to acknowledge you. Thank you for your service. And we had some folks in the comments who even said that. Thank you for your service, Nate. And, um, where do I want to take this thing next? You know, there's someone I know in my personal life that uh, spoke so highly of you. I've had multiple people just bragging on you saying, Chris, you need to bring Nate on the channel. And they were saying that you're such a talented writer. And I see that because I do follow you and you're just, you're so crisp and it poignant. And I want to start to get, uh, dig into the importance of writing as a skill set. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I'll kind of tie a couple different topics here together. Yeah. So how I first started writing is because I wasn't going to therapy. I should have been. And so I just started writing my own kind of stories. And that was my own version um, of therapy, essentially. And uh, over time, I discovered like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. Um, so I wrote like two personal memoirs just on the weekends for the fun of it. And I really enjoyed it. And then what I started to realize is like, okay, as I bring this into the office, like my ideas in person are way more crisp. I'm able to communicate very precisely exactly what it is that I want. Um, my writing can be in meetings that I'm not in. And then applying that to selling, it can help. We go back to the example that we started with around the technical buyer who has to go up to a P&L owner and sell a new product that they think can really make a difference in their work life. Well, writing out the message to create that link between the technical workflow and the business impact inside of a crisp summary almost like, you know, what you're putting together on the fly in this, but in written form so that now you can hand it to them and they have something to reference to guide them so that their message is as crisp as, you know, you would want it to be. Writing is the medium by which you can do that because it, it you will see very quickly, one, what you don't actually know and don't understand about the problem, back to the idea of selling is having a point of view to guide the types of questions that you're asking. What don't you know about the business and the problem? Um, what is most important that you've uncovered that you want to highlight and bring attention to first? And then third, back to this idea, oftentimes in writing, you will discover or be able to articulate something that was kind of maybe vague or you just didn't even realize that you did know and you have a specific idea for. Writing is the process by which you work that out. Um, so both for yourself, but then once you're in the sales role to enable your buyer to sell as well. So it's kind of a leading question, but how important is brevity when you're communicating, especially in sales, like with an executive and succinctness? Uh, important. <laughs> For the sake of brevity, I'll just answer with one word. But um, the you reality can. is, especially for an executive, most deals will come down to a single short sound bite. Two, three sentences, that's all that's going to stick. For example, I was talking with the um, EVP of product at MasterCard. And she was telling me this story of how to get a project approved. She would literally have people on her own team, right? Not an external seller, like people that she manages that report to her. She is like, I am so busy during the day. I literally have no time to meet with anybody. Yeah. And for one project that I finally approved, it was because a man on my team followed me into the women's washroom and he chased me down, went into the bathroom, trying to pitch the project. And oh my God. She was like, she was like he, he actually had to do that because it was the only way to like get the project reviewed and approved. Uh, interesting. And so she's like, you know, she's not like I'm upset. That's the reality of life as an executive, especially as you start moving up market and you start selling into the enterprise. And so the idea is you need an economy of speech if you can sell inside of a paragraph versus a whole PowerPoint, ditch the PowerPoint, use a written, a written paragraph. That's it. Leave it there. So a paragraph is better than a page, but a page is better than a whole PowerPoint. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned MasterCard because in my nine to five, I'm at a cloud consultancy and I'm talking to uh, Finicity, which is the open banking platform they acquired shaping their cloud strategy, trying to get in there. So we're touching similar companies. It's funny. But uh, hey, I got to come clean and you, you might even observe it in this conversation. My brain is a little bit chaotic. It's full of great ideas, but 
I've always had a little bit of a challenge with uh, clarifying my thoughts and being succinct. Now, I got a job at Google Cloud, and I think my passion, as you talked to earlier, outshine the fact that I can be long-winded. But it can also spill over into my, my written communication. So for someone like me or anyone out there who wants to become more succinct, is there a practice I can cultivate or how can I intentionally work on that to become like the crisp communicator you're describing? Yeah, so one, one um, exercise that you can do is take somebody else's writing, go find an article, take somebody else's follow-up email on your team and then rewrite it and see if you can cut down to half the words you do it in a third of the words. Oftentimes it is way easier to edit and clarify somebody else's writing than your own. So try that first. Second, what you'll notice inside of that exercise is typically every sentence inside of it has a couple kind of core ideas, um, core words even. And everything else around it is kind of filler, fluff. It's you working out how you want to get to that more important word. So when you go back, just highlight in your own writing, highlight those words in like yellow highlighter. What is the most important one or two words in this sentence? Then delete everything else out. Leave only what you've highlighted, the most important things. And then rewrite that and say, okay, how would I connect these ideas to make it make sense? And you're left with just the essence of the message. And that's what you're starting with. Mm. And oftentimes the act of writing is like you have to write a lot to get to those core words. And then you realize like, ah, this is what I'm actually trying to say. Then throughout the rest, leave that. Um, and then the very, very last thing, um, that I would say kind of a good, uh, a good exercise is give yourself a limited, a very limited starting point. So for example, if you're sitting down to write an email, say, okay, I have no more than 50 words. If you're writing, mm -hmm. say I have no more than one page, just starting with that constraint in mind will give you kind of an idea. And so for example, if you're trying to articulate a problem, instead of going on a long description, you might realize like, oh, if I just throw in some numbers and I can say, you know, there were 50 cases of severe, you know, bugs, bug reports from customers inside of the last week. Great. That's all you need to say. You don't need to go on to this big description of how the product is buggy and it's shoddy for certain customers. It's like how buggy for how many customers at one time frame? Great. 50 bugs severe priority in the last week. Boom. This is so valuable because what I've seen is, you know, being in a startup, I report directly to our CEO mm -hmm. and my ability to communicate succinctly to the global CEO is critically important. Otherwise it can damage trust and confidence in me as a seller, even if I'm doing all the right things. So just for the audience out there, what Nate's sharing is gold, soak it up. Cause it's not just about how we communicate with customers, but with our own leadership. Yeah, uh, well said. And that I will call out, those are two different chapters inside of the book, Selling With, that you mentioned at the start. Yes. One is on how to communicate with executives inside of an executive meeting. And then there's another that's called the minimum viable sentence. How do you cut down the amount of words that you need to communicate an idea? Yeah, guys, I, I'm going to get the book myself. Um, it, I've been in the industry for nine years, which isn't the most, but it's not. A, it's something to sneeze out. Shoot, I forget the expression or metaphor. You get the point. Yeah. And it's just, I could I would totally see you as a mentor, Nate. And this is something that will take me and many other sellers, especially in the enterprise uh, space, to the next level. So, guys, I did link the book in the description of this video, and we're going to get more to the concept of you know selling with buyer enablement and things like that in the heart of the book. But I'm still on this this path here of writing, and I wanted to carry this over to writing emails because there's a guy out there, Jake Push, that um, actually did some coaching with you, and he said you were just incredible. And you helped him identify how to craft compelling outbound messaging at his Series C stage cybersecurity firm that ended up generating a ton of pipeline. Like he was struggling and all of a sudden he worked with you and he's like, Nate was brilliant. And I started getting meetings. And he told me that you gave some advice. I don't expect you to remember this specific thing on how to um, work internally to craft really compelling messaging that resonates. So let's just talk about this concept for anyone who's new to a company or they're trying to figure out how to make great messaging, where do you start and how do you gather the data and ammunition to make that great messaging? Yeah, so the, the way in which I would start, so we, we've talked about this idea of frameworks quite a bit. The, the way to craft compelling messaging is one, to start with a solid framework, a point of view on what type of inputs do I even need? 
So what questions do I want to ask in a conversation? Because I'm starting with a point of view. Then from there, what you're doing is you are using the customer's language to create those inputs in your conversations to fill out the framework. So in a way, it's kind of like, did you ever play that game Mad Libs growing up? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the writing process. You start with a framework or a storyline, and then you work with the customer, their language, to build out the first draft. And then from there, the definition of good writing, because good writing is actually used, shared, seen, read inside of the buying team. When you can't be there, your words can be. So to make sure that that happens, you can't be the author. You can be the editor. You can help compile the first draft, but the author actually needs to be your champion and folks on the buying team. And so you need their voice, their language all over it. So you can get to that first draft with the Mad Libs process that I just mentioned. And then it's a process of inviting them in to say, hey, what doesn't fit? What would you say differently? What have we totally missed? And you don't even see on the page so that you're evolving that. Um, so that is, I would say, most people think of writing as a solo act. I, as the seller, do the writing. Yeah. And I would kind of say... I, I think that that misses the point. You're the editor. You're helping somebody else develop their writing because they're the one who has to own the message and go sell internally. So when it comes to a cold outbound email for say you're to start up or even new in a role in an enterprise organization and you're trying to generate those first meetings, yeah. what are the components of a great email? You kind of hit on, uh, it should be 50 words. I, maybe that was arbitrary, right? It needs to be concise. So there's subject lines. There's there's the, the body of the messaging. Any just high level thoughts on the architecture of a great outbound email? Yeah. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to reference a friend, Will, all read over at Lavender. They actually do have data on yeah. cold email length. And I haven't looked at the, like the most recent data, but around that 50 to 60 word, I think it's like between 70, 50 to 75 words is kind of the sweet spot within that band. Wow. And the reason is that the first thing that you're doing is you're just fighting for attention in brain space. And whenever something external comes into somebody, what are you doing? You're trying to figure out inside of the inbox, like my inbox probably has 150 unread messages that came in today. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look for sender names that are familiar, subject lines that feel important. For example, I'm hiring for an engineer right now. Um, if I see the position title, which is part of the job, you know, application instructions, like send a, send an email with a subject line this, because then it triggers in my mind, this is important to me. So your first thing is just to, one, get the email opened, because it is a subject line that matches up what they are currently thinking about is important and looking for first in their inbox. And then to keep that attention, you have to be brief. If I open up an unknown sender with something that doesn't relate to a project where I'm like, this is important and I have to do this tonight, as you can tell, like I have a cold, like I don't want to stay up all night. I want to go to bed. So what are the things that like I got to do? I got to get done. And so if you hit me with a whole block of text, I'm probably not even going to read it. I'm just going to say, ah, this feels like too much work. Um, I already have a headache, <laughs> literally. I don't want to yeah. read it. So I'll delete it. That's where brevity comes in, which also, by the way, um, enables formatting that is clear. Line breaks, um, clear, kind of concise. If your, were, if your message is 250 words versus 50 words, it's going to look totally different as well. So like I personally, when I'm writing my outbound emails, my cold emails, I will try to get it so that there is no, no overflowing or overlapping lines. It's just one line, one sentence, one sentence. I love with, that. With breaks in the middle. Yeah. Now I, I, I really can't wait to dig into the book and uh, it's just, again, I'm, I'm wordy and I, it's not like I don't say good things, uh, but this is just such an opportunity for me. And I know for a lot of the audience out there and guys, a standing ovation for Nate Nazarella showing up when he's feeling sick. His <laughs> daughter had to go to the doctor and was sick. You get so many messages in your inbox. Thank you for your generosity and being here tonight. And we will finish on time so you can take care of yourself. Oh, but, well. uh, Thanks for the invite, man. I've been looking forward yeah. to this. So I'm, I'm glad it worked out like I haven't fully lost my voice. So it's great. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, okay. One other thought, because um, I do want to get to, um, I'm stalling here, get to uh, buyer enablement and uh, selling with, okay, it came to me. Um, how thought? What are your thoughts on follow-ups? 
you know, like how do you follow up in a way that is maybe pleasantly persistent and, and is uh, thoughtful versus like um, thoughts or, uh, Hey, just checking in. Like how, how do you follow up? Yeah. So my, um, kind of general thinking is like, people don't forget to follow up with you. They don't believe something is not important enough. And okay. so typically like nobody's going to forget that you sell a product, right? They're not going to say, Oh yeah, I remember meeting Chris. Like what's his product again? They'll see it. And this is after you've met somebody, right? So I'm, I'm taking it from the perspective of you've already had a, had a meeting. Um, so I know something about Chris. I know something about what's important. I know the context of our conversation. And so what I'm going to try to do inside of a follow-up is to attach and remind Chris of like, Hey, you mentioned this was important last time we spoke. Here's an example or something that I wanted to share with you because it's going to one, help you get your job done today. Now I'm not tying up something in like, Hey, you're only going to get value when you buy roll out and implement this product, especially complex product like an Oracle or a Google cloud. Yep. It's a long ways out in the future. So how am I going to use that follow-up to remind you of, Hey, this relates to something that you believe is important Two, I can give you something today that helps you so that three, you're like, yeah, actually this does make sense for me to put the time on my calendar for this now, you know, today. And so I see a lot of language inside of follow-up emails that comes down to this basic premise of like, Oh, Chris must have just forgot that he owed me an email. Mm. So let me just bump this up. And like some follow-up emails will literally just say, Hey, Chris, bumping this up. And they totally miss the point of like, if this was really important to Chris, he either A, would have already replied and followed up with you. Yeah. So you didn't even need to send a follow-up email. Or B, you have to resurface because of everything else going on in Chris's world, he has a cold. He was just at the pediatrician and he's got a bunch of emails. Hey, Chris, this is what was really important and how I want to help. That's the goal of a good follow-up email. So you're looking at the root of the problem too and preventing having to even follow up too much by being compelling in the way you engage and resonating with a customer. And uh, if anything, we can agree, don't just bumping this to the top of your inbox. I, I, I would used to say like friendly nudge to get this to the top of your inbox. And it sounds kind of nice, but it's it's fluff at the end of the day. So I've come yeah. along since then. Um, well, yeah, I ahead. wanted to add one point because you brought up a good point is like the best follow-up is one that isn't even needed. And I'll give you an example of like earlier today, I was doing a demo with a CRO who was checking out Fluent. Cool. And we were, we kind of went through it and he was like, Hey, this idea of building business cases is, you know, real is interesting. So toward the end of the conversation, I just asked, does this feel both interesting in our approach and important enough to you right now to go ahead and set some time to follow up? And he's like, interesting. Yes. The software, the approach is compelling, important enough. No, I have to hire four AEs by the end of the year to um, basically hit my headcount goal starting in January. So he's like, I know this, it, this doesn't make the top of my list right now through the end of the year. And so I was like, great. Now I know exactly where we stand. I was like, by when do you think you'll have those AEs ramped and everybody, you know, in place? He's like, well, kickoff is middle of January. I was like, great. Do you want to talk end of January? And, you know, if between now and then things shift, you just let me know. He's like, yeah, great. So now we have a calendar invite for end of January because I know it's going to make sense. So I'm not going to have to send him. I can send him something that I think is helpful, maybe makes me think of it, but I'm not going to expect a reply or a follow up because that's already taken care of. It's on the books for end of January. Man. So, uh, I don't know if like tactful is not the right word, but, uh, I feel like where this is the Ivy league of sales educations right here, you know? <laughs> so, um, we've got, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna say it comes down to staying on the same page with the person that you're talking with. And like yeah. now I know where he's at, I know where he's coming from and we're on the same page. Yeah. Yep. And we've got Quinn Peebles who said, just tuning in now, follow-ups are so delicate, man. It's true. And and so my other thing is, uh, Nate, as opposed to a follow-up after a first discovery call or a demo and you're trying to progress a deal, when you're following up after outbound cold outreach, and you, you mentioned how to write a nice email, um, we know that it just takes a certain amount of touch points to start out typically to get that first meeting. It's It's almost never the first email, no matter how good. So what are your thoughts on follow-ups as it pertains to cold outbound where you haven't got the first meeting yet? How do you do that tactfully? So I, I often think that people aren't following enough with enough people in the account 
Because what you're trying to do is find a person for whom this is a priority in that moment where they're like, this is important to me. Let's talk about it. And so what I'll do is I will try to broaden my outreach inside of the account. And then I will start to reference other people to say, hey, by the way, um, it seemed like maybe this could be a project that Chris owns as well. So I'm going to drop him a note. But if you think that this is something that's in your lane or somebody else's, just let me know. And so basically what I'm trying to figure out is like, okay, I think I can help based on my research in this account, but maybe you're not the right person who is actually owning this and there could be somebody else. So what I'm going to run that by you, you know, let me know if I'm off base there, but two, I'm going to go see, okay, maybe it's not Chris, but it's Jamie or somebody else. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the meat and potatoes to bring this conversation home. We still got some good time, about 20 minutes. Now, sellers don't close deals. Buyers do. That's such a cool statement. Tell us what that means. If you look at where a buying decision is actually being made, it's never when a seller is in the room. Like it's never on a Zoom call or a Teams call. And they're like, okay, I'm going to sign this contract in front of you and send it over to you. It's always behind closed doors when the seller isn't even in the room. And so when you look at, okay, where is the deal actually being closed? Where's the seller? They're not there. Who is the person then that is closing the deal? It's the champion of the buying team. So that's why when you look at the job description of a seller, it shifts from selling to buyers to close the deal. Because again, they're not the one that's, that's actually closing. To selling with a champion on the buying team to enable them to go close during an internal conversation. What does it look like to work with a buyer to develop a point of view with them? Can you walk through just some of the stages in that journey? Yeah. So if you kind of start very early, the first goal that you're trying to do is you're trying to frame up a high cost, high priority problem in writing, by the way, because you, you will be amazed how, how much you don't realize you either do or don't understand about the problem until you try to write it down. Things that in your head feel clear when you go to write it down, you're like, but is that actually the problem? Mm. So Framing a high cost, high priority problem in writing. That's step one. The reason why I use the word framing, by the way, it's also very intentional. One of the things that I talk about in the book is the example of the slow elevator problem. So Chris, let's say you you own in an apartment building and you have a bunch of tenants who are coming to you and they're like, Chris, the elevator is super slow. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to cut my lease. The question now, they've just framed the problem for you. They've said this elevator is slow. The question, however, is, is that, is that actually the case? Is that the problem? If so, what you're going to have to do is upgrade the hydraulic system inside of the elevator. That's very expensive. Could it be that the actual problem is that the wait is too long? You don't like being bored in the elevator. It's not that the elevator is moving too slowly. You can't stand the boredom. So what could we do? We could put mirrors inside of the elevator because what do people love to do? They love to look at themselves. Passes the time. Guilty. <laughs> right? So throw in some good music. Correct. It, exactly. That's right. Now, like, you know, there are all these like little mini TVs that play little news clips. They do it at the, at, like at the gas station while you're pumping your yeah. gas, too, yeah. right? So the idea there is how you are framing the problem at the start can totally change what solution the buying team ends up saying is, oh yeah, this is this is the right thing for us. So you not only have to frame the problem correctly. You also have to figure out where does this fall in level of priority? Like back to my example, talking with that CRO that I mentioned earlier today. Okay, so that's step one. Usually you're doing that with the first maybe contact or two, maybe a handful. Yeah. Next, you need to get some multi-threaded validation, just meaning lots of different people from different perspectives. For example, yesterday I was running a demo where I had um, learning and development, rev ops, sales enablement, um, sales leadership and uh, the CRO inside of the call. Totally different roles, different perspectives. Mm. And we have everybody on the same page to say, hey, do we believe, believe that the root cause of lost deals, confusion across everybody is the fact that nothing is written down and structured and sellers don't have a way to crisply cons- to message the value? Not They're not messaging it to the champion. They're not messaging it to implementation or CS. They're not messaging it back to the solution engineer. 
So nobody knows what they're demoing, what they're implementing, what the customer is being promised, right? So I had to get everybody all on the same page because at first, my first champion there was sales enablement. She was all for it, but was everybody else going to be all for it, right? So that's the next step. Then- Quick, quick pause. Yeah. Okay, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. We live in a world in B2B sales and solution selling where you have a buying com committee. And to your point, you had all these people in the in the call. They all care about different things. And so it's easy to get overwhelmed. Like, how do I make sure all these people's needs are being met? They all care about And I hit on the what they care about in the conversation. Is it effective to have like one-off conversations with the different key people? Or do you think bringing them all together to get in consensus is the move? I'm sure that's inevitable. But what are your thoughts on that piece? Yes. So that was what we started that meeting with yesterday, where we said, hey, the goal of the meeting today is to figure out if we're all aligned okay. on what's actually driving the problem. If so, we'll go deeper in individual conversations about how we could solve for this Ooh. together. I'm so, glad I brought that up. Okay. Yeah. So that literally the exact phrasing. And I had talked with, um, on Monday, before we did that conversation on Tuesday, I had talked with my champion there. And we had to find together, hey, what do you think is a good outcome? Hey, if everybody is thinking about this in a similar way and they're willing to set up individual one-on-one -on -one conversations to go deeper into the phone platform, fantastic. So that was that was literally the mark of a good meeting is individual conversations coming out of it. Beautiful. People are on the same page. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm glad we did. That was a good insight. Okay, the next stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This, by the way, can come a little bit earlier than that second one. But the next next idea is that you need the executive inside of the deal to say, okay, I'm going to sponsor a deeper evaluation here because this relates to an active initiative inside of the company. And so the idea is that it is far easier to sell with momentum behind you. You're, it is wildly difficult to change an executive's priority. It is far easier to align your project, your product, with that priority that again the definition of a priority is like i'm already sold on this you don't need to convince me that this is yeah. important yeah so you've created that alignment you've gotten um most likely it's an internal referral with the weight of them saying hey go check this out because this is important like spend time talking with and meeting with chris so you've secured that okay so once all of that happens what you're then doing is you're going deeper into confirming and aligning that everybody agrees with your approach that is differentiated, that you are the right fit. Because if we agree, okay, there's this big problem. It's standing in the way of an executive priority. Everybody is on the same page that we've got to do something. The question is, what's the right thing to do? And who are we going to do it with? And so that's where you're going a bit deeper into saying, okay, are we ultimately going to be the vendor of choice? Like, does everybody agree we can deliver the solution that you need to solve this problem in a way that others can? Once you get to that point, which, by the way, you may start to backtrack and people are like, well, actually, I don't know. Maybe I have a different view on the problem of what we're actually trying to solve for now, right? So it's not super, it's not always linear. It can kind of backtrack. Go for it. No, no, you, you go ahead. I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited about some other questions and trying to manage the time, but you go. Well, I'll kind of I'll kind of fast forward, but the, the piece when you start doing kind of larger, more complex deals is that most people underestimate the amount of time and steps that are required from a like, hey Chris, let's do it. Like let's yeah. roll with you to actually going live with the product. Yeah. And so SLIP, security, legal, infosec, procurement, all of the different steps that you need to take and to actually get a solution live can be just as long as that first piece, especially if you are aligned with an exec who is pushing the deal forward. <laughs> um, that second half of the sales cycle, when you, quote, got everybody sold, can take just as much time in certain cases. So the question I was going to ask is when I was at Google Cloud, we came up with internally with this mutual evaluation plan because we're trying to say we're on AWS and we need to figure out their business and technical criteria and come up with a plan for a pilot to prove out the technology because we found that if you're going to sign a $50 million deal. You're not going to do that without actually doing a pilot or testing it out. You need the confidence. And then the pilot leads to a next stage of scoping out a broader migration. And there's basically all these steps and we... 
would present, it was kind of awkward, this bulky plan and a sheet of all the steps and try and get an agreement and at, like block them out with it, it of the calendar and trying to control the deal. But I just wanted, I, we would do that. And, and I'm just wondering, is that, do you have processes like that? Um, and there's a difference between the SaaS and like a really complex, like cloud platform deal. But yeah. what are your thoughts? Do you have any tools to like control the process? Yeah. So they go by all different types of names, mutual action plan, evaluation yeah. plan, joint success plan, so on. Yep. Um, basically it's what are the steps that a specific owner is going to complete by a specific date to keep the buying process moving forward. It's great. The mistake most people make with them is they put them too soon in the process before people are already aligned on like, why does this matter? Why is this worth solving? They're talking about, hey, this is how you're going to evaluate the product and what we're going to do together. And so they're like, why are you assigning me all of this homework and things yeah. to do if I'm not even on board on why this is important? And so that upfront, that business case, the exec summary has to be in place, signed off, everybody's aligned. And then you'll actually see that mutual action plan, evaluation plan be far more effective when you're moving into, okay, let's keep everybody on the same page and some momentum going. Mostly, by the way, so that they know what to expect on like, okay, this is what's required from you um, to make sure that we are moving forward. Again, back to the idea of keeping people on the same page. Um, so that's what I would say. And then on the um, piece on the pilot, you know, hey, big purchase, we got to do some type of pilot to figure out if this is right for us. Yeah. Our approach, what we would do is um, we would... We'd, we'd build what we would call a hardwired proof of concept or a hardwired pilot where we would say, okay, if we're all aligned on if this is successful, if this pilot goes according to plan because we hit one, two, and three clear measurables, what do we want this to be? Like, how will we expand? What are we doing? And most people leave that conversation until after the pilot. They're like, hey, prove it out. Let's, you know, trial this and then let's go. Now, in a $50 million cloud platform, it's a little bit less of like, we'll figure it out afterward. But the majority of SaaS, I call it pilots, are actually just like kind of an undefined trial process. And so you restart a new sales cycle afterward. Far better to say, what are the one or two points that you are most skeptical or concerned about? Let's build a very short and contained pilot that is very specific to proving those two things. If we prove those things as evidenced by proof points one, two, and three, then okay, we automatically roll into the long-term plan that everybody's on board with. I got a question from Quinn. And again, I'm looking eye on the clock to make sure you get a yeah. good night's sleep tonight and take care of yourself. But he said, what's Nate's best tips for creating engaging next steps at the end of a discovery call? I like that pointed question. And I, I know you, you'll have some good thoughts on it. Um. So you can, you can usually start to tell if somebody is leaning in or if they are leaning out. And so what I'll, I'll, I'll start to um, kind of figure out, like if I sense that they are leaning out, I'll just say is like, hey, you know, you mentioned all the different things that are going on, like hiring, planning for the SKO. Does it even make sense to continue the conversation before that stuff? Or should we maybe think about this for next year? And I'll just try to kind of sort myself where do I sit on there? Like if they were to in the morning, wake up and write, these are the three most important things for me. Do I make those top three? Am I on that list at all? Mm. If not, then I'm trying to figure out, okay, what would need to change in order for me to fit inside of that top three? What's a circumstance or the scenario under which it does make sense to say like, yeah, this is important. And so you may just do a little bit more discovery to kind of figure that out. Because at that point, once you do that discovery, then you should know. In other words, the mark of a good next step is when you propose it, it's immediately accepted mm. because you're aligned and you're suggesting something that feels right to the buyer. And so that's why when I said, hey, I'm going to send you this invite end of January, as soon as we got off the call, it was accepted mm. because it was the next step that matched where they were at. So you want that confirmation on the call itself. And then oh, the yeah. consequence is that the invite is accepted. And Nate, I'm leaning in. We're all leaning in. So the next step of us checking out your book, I think we got that taken care of. <laughs> You'll just see some purchases. So <laughs> anyways, we're, we're, we're almost wrapping up here. But uh, you mentioned the executive briefing document. 
And yeah. that led to a question I wanted to ask you, which is like, what are some of the other critical assets, written assets that are a part of monster enterprise deals, like including the executive briefing and like, where, where do these documents fit in? Yeah. So what you'll find, by the way, is that is kind of like the master document from which you are building all of the other types of content. So for example, you might, uh, so I'll often be uh, building out like a key account brief or an internal deal team brief that I might be sharing to, you know, one of our executives, um, a value map or a demo brief to hand to a sales engineer. Hey, this is what they care about. This is what they're trying to accomplish. It's all derived from that, <clears throat> that overall executive summary. Um, you could even use that to spin off your follow-up emails, right? Or a affordable email yeah. your champion is going to send over to the executive. So it all comes back to that is, that is like the master. Where do, so do you create like practically speaking, like a, I use Google drive, you know, a folder for the customer. And, um, and then we have in there like executive briefing, Google doc, and you keep that up to date. And then what other, doc, like, can you talk about the practical management of documentation for like a, yeah. when you have a legit opportunity with a nice size enterprise client? The most common thing I see, like in, so inside of Fluent, there's a workspace inside the platform for each opportunity or each account where all of the docs are generated, created, and live. The most common thing that I see people coming from is either A, I have a Google Drive folder and I put all of the different docs inside of the uh, Google Drive, or B, Microsoft Shops, I'll see a seller creating a OneNote and they'll have a tab with a bunch of different types of docs for that particular account. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I got I to gotta ask you on the book, because um, we have limited time, but what are some of the aspects of the book chapters that make your heart sing? It's cheesy, but like, what do you, what is, it's your baby. Like, it, what, uh -huh. what are some of the chapters that you love that they, when people check out the book that they, they can look forward to? I think some of the ones that were kind of the most enjoyable for me to write is um, the prologue, a very memorable story, an example of a deal that I was working on. Yeah. Um, so that's the very first thing that you read inside of the book. Um, the, actually, the whole first part, because it sets up a change in the way sellers look at their job description, so it's basically chapters one through three. That was the most enjoyable for me to write. Um, some of the other chapters later on, there's about like 24, 25. Um, I don't have a copy around me, something like that. But um, the chapter on selling to executives, mostly because for early career sellers, it's a source of a lot of anxiety. And so after they read that chapter, and it's the one that I hear about often is like, they just feel ready and confident and at peace. Like, okay, I can go hold an effective conversation with an executive. Um, then one of, one of the very last ones becoming a non-anxious seller is an important, mm. you see some of my story in there links back to some of the topics like therapy that we were talking about. Um, so that's another one that sticks out. Ooh, I mean, I, I love the theme of, uh, stepping into, I'm just making this up, but like stepping into our badassery, becoming the best version of ourselves, the most confident version. Cause I, um, in high school, I was one friendliest guy, but I was really anxious. I was that anxious, nice guy. And I've come a long way. And I like to think that sales was a vehicle to self-development, but do you have any nuggets on just high level, like a little inspiration on dealing with and overcoming anxiety? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say for myself, um, I basically harnessed my anxiety and turned it into a willingness to learn. Mm. And what I found is I was most anxious when I felt like I was stepping into something that was unknown and I had to sort my way through it without any type of knowledge or mental tools to fall back on. And so if anxiety is the negative emotion that you're feeling, what is the opposite positive emotion that you want? For me, it was confidence. And so I, I would say, okay, well, what's the source of my anxiety? Well, it's I'm stepping into something that I have no clue how to do. Then what would make me feel confident is having something to rely on and say, oh yeah, okay, I know what to do in this scenario. And that's where I would go learn. I love it. And in fact, that anxiety was like a a driver to seek knowledge and, and ultimately overcome it in a way. And so thanks for sharing that because we all deal with it. Like, oh my gosh, it's just a part of being human. Yeah. Now, any, any thoughts to riff? Cause I had a, had a question on fluent, but I, I just say it never goes away. Like there's still things that I'm doing new for the first time and I get anxious and I fall back on those tools and then I go say, okay, what do I need to go learn? And, um, so I, I just say, don't think that you've arrived when you 
all of a sudden are at this pure state of emotional bliss and you never feel a wave of anxiety. That, and that's, just, that's just encouraging, Nate, for us to hear because we see you with like 50,000 plus uh, followers on LinkedIn, author, sales guru, <laughs> and I'm putting you on a pedestal here. And yet Nate still is human and experiences anxiety. So it's encouraging for all of us, whatever stage of the journey that we're at. So I just wanted to wrap up, aside from guys encouraging you to check out the book, Selling With, again, linked in the description of this video, I want to encourage you to, um, if you know any CROs or you know sales executives, bring up Fluent, right? And it, can you tell us a little bit about what um, like Fluent is all about? Yeah, it's built around um, a lot of the practices that we've been talking about. It takes your buyer's words, language from sales calls and turns it into a structured executive summary, business case draft, deal briefs, so that um, you can build the message that you actually want to enable your champion to go sell with internally. So that's that's the idea of the, the platform is making it easier for you as the seller to go enable your buyer to sell. I love it. And I deal with a lot of CROs in my own nine to five. So I'm going to keep eyes and ears open to the market and be a hype man for you on that front, along with the book. Do you have a final challenge or call to uh, action for the audience before we sign off? Yeah, I would say, so if you go, <clears throat> if you go check out um, like Fluent on our blog, what you'll find is an example of what the software can write for you. It's called the one page business case, but you can download a Google docs version of it and try just taking the practice, try taking the practice of building out a one page business case, an executive summary style business case inside of one of your deals. And the reason why I encourage people to try that Google docs version is then you will see very quickly of like, okay, I am now thinking differently about what type of inputs I need inside of my deal. And what you'll find then is like, for example, when you have an effective conversation, you're getting compelling inputs, then like the drafts that Fluent writes for you, you're feeding it the right information. And so it all comes back to like writing. And it's funny, like as an AI company, I'm like, go do this the old school way. Like go just try write it on your own. DIY, Google Docs. That's where I would encourage everybody to start. That is like your one action item, one takeaway. And by the way, if you're a student and like you're not yet into a sales role, I'd still go check it out and you'll begin to kind of see the way in which, you know, maybe you want to like propose to a professor, like, Hey, will you fund this type of after school program? There are so many different applications for it, but give it a shot. Try the writing exercise. That would be my one takeaway. Well, thank you so much for showing up again, in spite of all the things you have going on. And especially if you're a student checking out Nate's work, checking out Fluent in his book, you were going to get so ahead of the curve in terms of your career and honestly, your life. So guys, um, <laughs> got, a, got a funny, uh, uh, okay, one, one final thing, Nate, um, put, I'm putting you on the spot, but Quinn was like 15 second pitch on why I should buy the book. I mean, cause I'm buying it. Okay. But what about, what would you say, uh, Nate? <laughs> um, so I will tell you what I hear from other people. I and love what, it. What other, people, what other people say is this is the one book that is about where a deal actually happens. Everything else that I'm reading in sales books, sales trainings is about a fraction of what's going on inside of the sales meeting. This is what's going on inside of the buying team conversation. Boom. And that's why I called this, the title of this um, interview, A New Approach to Enterprise SaaS Sales in 2024. It's just a different way of operating. And how can you get better results if you're not doing things differently? So Nate, thank you for your time. Thank you everyone is showing up for showing up today to your success in tech sales and in life. Happy selling and happy living. And we'll see you in the next one.